Hello, my name is Judy Osmer and we're going to make soap today. First, a disclaimer. Every effort has been made to ensure that the information contained here is accurate. However, due to differing conditions, tools, and individual skills, I cannot guarantee the information is applicable to your situation. I am not responsible for any injuries, losses, or damages that may result from the use of this information. Behind me are some of the examples of some of the soaps that I've been able to make within the last year. I learned how to make soap in California and have made up some of my own recipes and have thoroughly enjoyed the soap making process. Now let's look at the equipment that we're going to need to make soap. First, you're going to need something to mold your soap in when you're done. To line your molds, you're going to need some Reynolds butcher paper, the plastic lined. You're going to need a mold made of wood or other hard formed surface that will hold up to the heat hot soap that you're going to put into it. Molds can be made of wood or plastic. Some of them can be inexpensive or free. Others can be made by your husband. Others can be bought from places like Mission Peak in California. You can also use these paper wax lined cartons, milk cartons, for molding soap. These are a one use only. You just tear it off and you don't have to line them. There are other things you're going to need besides your molds. You're going to need a good digital scale. You're going to need several Pyrex type heat resistant measuring cups. Make sure that they are glass and of good quality. If you can pour boiling water into them, you can make use them to make soap. You're going to need an 8 cup for your water. You're going to need a 4 cup for your liquid oil. You're going to need a 2 cup for measuring your lye. And you're going to need a 1 cup or some similar small for your fragrance oils. You're going to need a good hard plastic spoon for stirring your lye. Don't get something that's cheap. Make sure it's impermeable because this is what you're going to use to stir your lye water. You're going to need some good rubber gloves, some other small ceramic containers for various measurings, a stainless steel pot, a heat resistant spatula or a high heat spatula, various stainless steel measuring spoons, you're going to need a pH tester for your hot process soaps to make sure that the cooking process is done. When you're using a double boiler method, you're also going to need a second larger stainless steel pot that the first one will fit into creating your double boiler. You're going to need two meat style thermometers to measure your oils and your lye. You're going to need a stainless steel stirring spoon. You're going to need a stick blender. You're going to need a hot plate some small spatulas, your fragrance oil if you choose to scent your fragrance, and you're going to need your coloring if you choose to color your soap. You're also going to need a container with half vinegar and half water. This is to neutralize any lye spills that may happen. You're going to need some paper towels for that, and also Speaking about neutralizing lye spills, one of the things you're going to want to make sure as you're getting everything together is that you do not have any kind of aluminum anywhere, including in your trash can. One soda can in your trash can can create a large amount of toxic, poisonous fumes if you have a lye spill of soap and then you put the paper towels in on top of that. Lye and aluminum are very reactive together. Make sure there is nothing aluminum anywhere around or about the area that you're going to be making soap in. Once you have your equipment assembled, you're going to need to decide what recipe you're going to use and what method you're going to use. Obviously, I have set up for a hot process double boiler method of making soap. And the recipe I am going to use is one that I made up myself. I call it sunflower olive and it uses coconut oil, palm shortening, sunflower oil, castor oil, olive oil, and beeswax. The liquid that we're using is distilled water. 
we're using 8.8 .8 ounces of lye for a 7% super fatting. I'm using 3 ounces of lavender essential oil and 2 teaspoons of grape pop mica in about a half an ounce of olive oil. I'm also going to be using a 1 half teaspoon of rosemary oleo resin it's called ROE. I have a hard time pronouncing it, obviously, but it is used to um, extend the shelf life. It is a natural preservative because we are going to be super fatting our recipe. What that means is there's going to be more free oil in the recipe in the finished soap bar than there is lye, thus making the soap bar more moisturizing on your skin and much more gentle. If our lye and fat ratio was very, very close, you'd have a much more drying or astringent bar. So we want one that's going to make your skin nice and soft and feel good. And between 5 and 7% super fatting is the ideal super fatting. How you come up with those figures is you use a lye calculator. And the use of a lye calculator and the examples of that will be at the end of this video. Next, we're going to get our mold ready for our soap. Take our butcher paper that has the shiny side up. We're going to get it ready for the mold. Measure it out by making small creases that you're going to be able to follow. Because I know my mold, I know how to do this. Fold along your edges to where your paper is going to fit side to side in your mold. Then crease and fold to make it fit on the inside. Okay. Now the fun part. You unfold your paper. You have creases here and here. Bring the creases together. Line them up. Make a crease, and you've just made a package end. Do it for the same side. Turn it over. Repeat the process. Simply fold crease to crease and then crease that crease to crease make a crease and now you have your package end and it just slips right into your mold and you have it I go a little bit further some people will just trim things off. I cut down the corners so that you can just fold it down. have it. Your mold is lined and ready to go. Now that we have all of our equipment, our ingredients all organized and out, we have our soap mold ready to go. The next step is to get started making the soap. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to turn on the fire for our double boiler and we're going to get that going. Next, 
we're going to put our pre-measured ingredients into the pot. I have, for this recipe, two ounces of beeswax, eighteen ounces of coconut oil, and eighteen ounces of palm oil. Our solid fats need to be melted so we put them in the stainless steel pot. Bring them over to our other burner. Turn the heat on low. We have already pre-measured 18 ounces of sunflower oil two ounces of castor oil, and six ounces of olive oil into here. What we do not have is, what we do not have is the preservative in there yet. This is the ROE, Rosemary Oleo Resin Extract. And I get it from Mission Peak Soaps in California. By coating it, we make sure that all of it goes in. Away. This gets moved over here because that will get mixed into the hot oils once they're melted. Next, we're going to measure the lye and mix the lye water. Make sure you have good protection. Put your gloves on. Make sure you have eye protection. I'm wearing an apron. Sodium hydroxide lye that I get from the lye guy over in New York. We want, by our recipe, 8.8 .8 ounces of it. We make sure that our glass is clean and dry and there's no water in there. We are. Oops, we have a little bit more than what we should. There. We have our hard spoon. We have our lye. We have 24 ounces worth of water, distilled water. Now we're going to go outside and mix the lye water. Now we're outside on a bright, beautiful, sunny day, and we're going to mix our lye water. Some people mix it inside, making sure they have fans and other things. I don't recommend it. Do whatever you feel you need to do. I always mix my lye water outside, because when you put the lye in the water, it's going to off-gas the chemicals that you do not want to breathe in. It is a caustic vapor that will do damage to your lungs. I have made my lye water in snowstorms and rainstorms and on cloudy days and there has not been any effect to the extra little bit of precipitation that might get into my lye water. So what you want to do is always put the lye into the water, not the other way around. I give my glass a tap. I found that the lye will come out better, and you just pour it in. Make sure all of the little bits are out, and stir it well. Kind of holding my breath till I gauge which way the wind is going. Okay, now we're going to back up. Because I am holding my breath when I'm over there. As you can see, there are vapors rising out of the lye water. And you don't want to be anywhere close to that. So, 
We are going to leave that sit for approximately 15 minutes and let it all the vapor come out of it and we're going to go back in and watch our oils melt. Okay, we're back inside. We've rinsed out our container that had the lye in it. One of the best ways to deactivate any kind of lye to make it to where it's not harmful is to flush it with large amounts of water. We all have water, so make sure that that is the first safety precaution that you have when it comes to lye. We're over here right now watching our oils melt. We give them a little bit of a stir and we just wait for them to turn to a liquid. Chopping them up tends to get them to melt a little faster, but other than that, we just do this until it is done. It's been a few minutes now and our oils are all now melted. We've turned off the fire and we've got lovely golden oils all melted and ready to go. This is our palm, our coconut, and our beeswax. Put it over on the hot pad. Now we're going to add our liquid oils. We just pour them right in. Scrape the sides because we don't want to leave anything behind. One of the things with soaps is that we use expensive ingredients so we don't want things to go to waste. That's also one of the reasons for this little video is because a lot of people have had unsuccessful soap making and because of that have wasted expensive ingredients. Hopefully this little video will help that not happen to you. We stir them in and then we take one of our thermometers and we put it in the oil and check the temperature. The temperature is important but not as critical as some would think. We are not making cold process, which is a little more touchy. We're making hot process. And for a hot process soap, you simply want your oil temperature to be anywhere under 130 degrees. Right now, we are at 132 degrees. So we have cooled off quite a bit. And we're ready to now go out and bring in the lye water. It's been about 15 minutes now. All of the off-gassing that the lye water is going to do is done. We've brought it in the house and we're going to take the temperature. We're going to see if we're ready to make soap yet. It's got to be under about 125 degrees and it looks like we are ready. Stir it up to make sure you don't get a false reading. What said 100 is now going up to about 120. The lye water is ready. Now all we have to do is wait for the oil temperature to drop below 130 and we will be ready to go to the next step. Okay, I'm te testing the temperature of my oil again and we are at just about 130 degrees. So, that means my oil is ready to make soap. And my lye water is ready to make soap. It is at about 125 degrees. So when we take this out, again, we rinse it very well with water, thus deactivating any lyers or any kind of problems there. Now we're going to mix the lye with the oils and make soap. Just got your nice clear soap or oils. Now you pour the lye in. It gets kind of cloudy. Take this over. I always rinse everything with lye well immediately. The less caustic things sitting around to cause a problem, the better. Now we're going to use our stick blender. Make sure it's completely submerged before you turn it on. And then you turn it on. A stick blender should be used in 5 to 30 second bursts. Before the advent of the stick blender and the discovery by other soap makers of how wonderful it works, you had to stir it and stir it and stir it because the chemical reaction that is taking place in the pot right now is called saponification. You are bringing lye, which is a caustic, 
into contact with two things that don't mix, oil and water. That caustic is changing the chemical properties of those oil and water to where they chemically do mix and form a completely different molecule. That's called sponification. But to have sponification take place, you need another ingredient, and that ingredient is friction. Without the friction, it just sits there as a caustic, oily mess. The stick blender brings us our friction, and in a fraction of the, ta of the time that it took Grandma to make soap, we now have the sponification process going on. It's been three or four more minutes. I've continued to use the stick blender in five to thirty second bursts to stir the soap, and we now have it at that magical point called trace. I've read many books, couldn't find out what trace was. Trace is simply thick. If you can see, when I bring this up, it looks like a pudding to where you can trace a line of the soap across the top of it and it stays. This is what I would consider a good strong or heavy trace. If I were doing a cold process, I would have stopped a few minutes ago with a light trace. So now we're going to get the soap ready to put it into the double boiler. I'm going to scrape this off and get this raw soap as much of it off the stick blender as I can. Because of the lye and the fact that the soap is raw, the sponification process has just begun. It is not completed. This soap is caustic. So we treat it very, very carefully. We use our gloves. Come over here and get a picture of the boiler. We've got just a nice little boil going on in our pot. And now we just put them together and we stir it every three to five minutes. The heat is going to force the saponification process to happen rapidly. Right now, this stage I call pudding. And it will stay in the pudding stage for about ten minutes. As the soap cooks, it changes consistency. It gets thicker and thicker, and it gets rather clumpy. And right now, it's kind of thick and clumpy, and it's changing its consistency. It's going from something that looks like a very thick pudding into something that looks a lot like applesauce. This is normal and it's part of the progression of the saponification. Stir continuously or continue to stir every three to five minutes throughout the process. About five minutes more have gone by. Again stirring every three to five minutes and now we have something that looks more like applesauce. This is a normal stage. It goes from pudding into applesauce to where it looks like it's separating even the oils and stuff, and it really does. It looks a whole lot like applesauce. This is another reason why you don't want to have little children or anybody around or any kind of distractions while making soap. You would hate to have your husband come along and go, Ooh, honey, what's cooking? and have a bite of this. We continue to stir every three to five minutes and as the saponification process is happening, we are now entering a stage moving from applesauce into what we call mashed potatoes. It starts looking kind of fluffy, filling with air, the water is beginning to evaporate out of it. This is also a time when you really have to pay attention because ouch, sometimes, not always, but sometimes, the water will evaporate so rapidly if you don't stir it enough that the soap will begin to volcano right out of your pot. The cure for that is just simply watching your soap 
and stirring it as needed. So anyways, you can see here it's starting to get fluffier and fluffier as we stir and it's really beginning to resemble a pot of mashed potatoes. And yes, with a double boiler method, with the water boiling underneath, you do sometimes get hot water splashed on you. That's just a part of the process. Mashed potatoes. Now that it's in the mashed potatoes stage, to where we can see and know and it's not questionable, we are almost done and we can set our timer. I set my timer for seven minutes. We can also do our first pH test. This right now is still raw soap, though it's coming to the end of it. By doing a pH test, we just get a little bit of the soap, put it on the plate, get our pH tester, and see if we still have lye in there. As you can see, it's starting to, to turn a little bit pink. That pink tells me there is still free lye in the soap, and the saponification process is not complete. When it is complete, there will be no pink. See how fluffy the soap is looking? I will continue to stir a little more often, probably every 30 seconds or so, I will stir and I will scrape my edges for the next six or seven minutes while the sponification process is finished. Okay, my timer has gone off, it's been between five and seven minutes, and I'm going to retest the soap and see if the sonification process is finished. Get a bit of it. Put it on the plate. And put the pH tester on it again and let's see if we have a different response. Oh, and we do. No pink is showing up. It looks like our soap is finished. This means that all the lye that I used has now been used in the sponification process. There is no more free lye in this bar of soap. So I turn off the double boiler, I take it out, put it on the hot pad. Now we have to let our soap cool. If we wanted to do just an unscented and uncolored soap, we would take it right from here, put it in the mold, let it cool off, and we have soap. This is no longer raw soap. This is finished soap. This is not caustic anymore. It's not going to harm you any more than it's going to harm you tomorrow when you use it in your shower. Because this soap is very hot right now, we have to be careful with our fragrance oils. Fragrance oils and essential oils all have what's called a flash point. That is a point to where the oil gets hot and it turns into a vapor. It goes to gas form and you lose all of that expensive scent oil. So you got to have your flash points and know your flash points. Sometimes they come from the manufacturer. Sometimes that you have to look them up online. We're using lavender essential oil that comes out of Bulgaria. I get it from FPI, which is up in Canada, and its flash point is 160 degrees. So I have to wait for my soap to lower temperature down to below 160 degrees before I put my scent in it. Right now, the temperature of this oil is 184 degrees. We have a little ways to go. In the meantime, I can stir in my colorings because my colorings don't matter whether I stir it in now or later. So, I've got my great pot mica in a little bit of olive oil and I'm just going to dump that in there using my little spatula to make sure I get it all. Now, 
we stir. This also helps the cooling process. Because with hot processed soaps, it takes a lot of vigorous stirring to get the colorants nicely mixed in. Some people don't like to do that, and they like this kind of marbly look that you get. But I like a nice, smoothish looking bar. If I want a marbly look, I will take and split my batch and put two different colors in. That's another thing that you can do with this. just continue to stir and scrape. We're not going to be constant, but we're going to stir every two to three minutes so that our soap doesn't set up. The coloring is going to be mixed in, the temperature is going to be lowered, and we're not going to let this soap set up because we want to put the lavender essential oil in it. So. We just keep moving it around and measure it every so often and watch the temperature go down. And we'll be back when it gets to lower than 160 degrees. It's been 15 or 20 minutes or so, and we have stirred and measured and stirred and measured and kept the sides of our pot scraped down so that our soap does not set up and it still stays nice and malleable. But we did need to get that temperature down to below 160 degrees. We are at 154 degrees now. We're ready for the last step. We're going to add our lavender essential oil and then put it in the mold. We have pre-measured three ounces of lavender into the pot it goes, and we stir. The edges of the spoon are kind of rough, not hot. Keeps me from getting blisters. Okay, the lavender is well stirred in. My mold is sitting here ready to go. Dump it in. Press it into the corners good. Okay. Now, smack it in. That gets the soap to settle into the mold. To make, you can leave your surface like this if you'd like. If you like a like a, a, a roughish kind of look, you can leave it just the way it is. But I like a nice smooth look to the top of my soap, and this also helps me get it evenly placed in the mold. With a piece of plastic wrap. I can move the soap around to a certain degree, forcing more over into the corners to give me a nice square edge and over onto the sides and smoothing out the top to give me a nice product. The soap I make isn't for looks. The soap I make is for use.
You want a nice smooth bar in your hand when you're lathering up in the shower. This is a little trick to help smooth out the handprints I just put in it. Give it one more bit of a smacking. Make sure it's settled. Make sure it's settled in well. And I'm done. Now that we've finished our soap and we're waiting for it to cool before we cut. There are some details and some different things that I want to talk to you about, about the various different processes of making soap. What I just demonstrated for you was my favorite method, the double boiler method. There is another way to make hot process soap that I was taught and that I've done several times to where instead of using a double boiler, you use a crock pot for that method. And it works just fine. You need to do less stirring until right about the end, but you do need to watch it very closely for volcanoing and then stir as you need to. One of the problems that I have found with that method is that in the finished soap, it gets done along the edges a little bit more, and then it won't all take to the color, leaving little white spots in your solid color soap. Obviously, if you wanted this look, that there would be no problem or that if you were not going to center color your soap, it would not be a problem. But because of the looks that I like in my solid bars of soap, it really doesn't look quite as professional as I'd like to see them be. So I have used it almost exclusively the double boiler system that does not give me these kinds of little white spots in the bar that the crock pot method does. The other method of making soap is called cold process. And when you get your soap up to trace, that's when you stop the process and you add your colors, your scents, put it in the mold, and then insulate it with some heavy towels or, sh or blankets or something and then set it aside for two days, maybe three days while that soap is going through the saponification process on its own. It's slower, it's caustic while it's doing it, and you have to put it someplace where it's not going to be disturbed and it's going to be very level. Obviously if it's not level it's not going to stay nice in your um, in your mold and you're going to have lopsided soap, but you can do all kinds of fun things with it when it's cold processed. You can make swirls you can make waves. You can make some layers. This is kind of hard to see, but this is called pink grapefruit. And that's a light pink layer with yellow um, layers on top. So you can do some things that are a little more fun and a little more fancy, but it's also a little touchier. Most of your fragrance oils you've got to be real careful with. If you haven't tried and tested that particular fragrance oil in a cold processed soap, you're going to need to do that first because I've had fragrance oils that work wonderfully in hot processed make the soap seize. And when you have a fragrance oil that has caused your soap to seize, what you have is a caustic nasty curdled mess that now you have to dispose of very, very carefully because the lye is still in it and it is still very caustic and it is a problem. I've only had one half batch seize on me and I don't want to ever have that done again. So I'm very, very careful and I test for seizing on small amounts of soap within my, my, uh, what do you call it? I'm careful with the inventory of fragrance oils that I have and I test them out before trying them in a cold processed type of soap. Hot process that I use to where it's a double boiler method, I have been able to do a lot of wonderful different things with. I've been able to do layers like the cold process. They look a little different, but they're bright and they're vibrant and they're fun. This one here is kind of a mix of a layer and a marble, kind of marbled the top. 
putting blobs of different colored soap in with a layer of green on the bottom. This one's called Orange Blossom. I've been able to do marbling, which is a two-tone effect that you do with your soap to where before you color it, but after you have scented it so that all the soap is the same fragrance. You split the batch of soap, you color one, is in this case one gets colored purple, one gets colored pink. And then I take, once they're mixed in well, I put a spoon of pink in and then a spoon of purple in and I alternate the spoons as I fill up the mold. And that gives us a really nice marbled look that's a lot of fun and adds real variety to your soap making processes. But what I do with the hot process gives me just such a wonderful look, even with just the solids, that it's just been my favorite ever since I started making soap. You can even use different additives in your soap. This one's called vanilla bean. There's real crushed vanilla bean in here. You can put in herbs. You can put in spices. You can put in other colorants or flowers or whatever you want to do to decorate your bars. But you do that after the cook. Once it's cooling off, you can add your other things then. You can even use clays. This clay was added before the cook and it gave me a really smooth, lovely color. This clay was added after the cook, when I usually do, and it didn't mix in quite as well. But because clays are such stable colors, you can use clays to color your soap before you cook them. For everything else, I recommend that you put your coloring in after you cook. Some of our micas and oxides are not quite as stable in the high heat, so they can change. And coloring is all on what you have and what you want to do. It's very, very personal. I like bright, vibrant colors. Other people like things that are more muted. But this is where the artistry of making soap comes in. Because I can do more with the hot process, and have a product that is ready to use the very next day. Needs a little bit of curing, but if you don't get the curing done, you can still use the soap. And I have a good control over my colors and my molds. I have absolutely preferred the double boiler method of hot processed soap making. But there are other methods out there, and as you can see, I have experimented and I use both of them. Hello again. It's now the next day and we're ready to take the soap out of the mold. It's nice and cool. The surface is good. We've taken the plastic wrap off. And now we're going to rip the paper and get it off the soap. Nice big hunk of soap. We slide it back into the mold. That's also the cutter. And we slice. This cutter is made by a fellow named David Crutchfield at Mission Peak Soaps. And you can buy these from him online. I really like this cutter and this mold because my husband was able to make more molds the same size and so I can make multiple batches of soap using this mold, using the other molds, but put them all in here for cutting. Gives me a nice standardized sized bar that's easy to price and sell. Oops, that happened. There's your bar of soap. These trays are also from Mission Peak. And we'll just line up the soaps for them to cure out. And this is what we made. A beautiful lavender bar of soap. It's got a nice scent. It's got a nice fragrance. It's got a nice color to it. It's ready to use right now if you wanted to. 
the longer you let it cure, the harder it's going to get. I have found that about an ounce of soap will last one person in the shower about seven days. So a four and a half to five ounce bar of soap will be about a month's worth of use for your standard ordinary person. This size mold with the size batch that I did will make 18 four and a half to five ounce bars of soap and that will last one person well over a year. Earlier in the tape we discussed a lie calculator. I use the one that's done by Magic Mountain Sage and it's very easy to get to. You just ring in www.thesage.com and it says welcome the lie calculator. You're going to click on the lie calculator and this is what you're going to see come up. Scroll down because then you're going to start filling in some blanks. The recipe title, we're going to do Sunflower Olive. And created by Judy Osmer. And we're using, of course, ounces as our weight of measure. We're using sodium hydroxide. We are using a powdered form, not a liquid form. We're not adding sodium lactate, which is an additive that you can get that when using a hot process soap, it can make it a little more malleable or a little more easy to work with. But I haven't found that I needed that. But it is an option if you'd like to. Liquid of choice is going to be water and fillers, fragrances, and notes, we don't use that. You can even have include basic soap making instructions in your printout that you're going to do. Then you come down because every oil has a different amount of lye that it needs to saponify it. You put in how much you're getting. See here I have found olive oil. I'm going to be using six ounces of olive oil palm oil. I'm going to be using 18 ounces of palm oil. Coconut oil is over here. There it is down there. We just scroll down and find it. There's our coconut oil. I want 18 ounces of coconut oil. And castor oil. I'm going to be using two ounces of castor oil. And I'm going to be using sunflower oil. I'm going to have 18 ounces of that. And then the last part of our recipe is the beeswax. So let's go find beeswax, which is right up here. Two ounces of that. Making sure that my math is correct and that it's for 64 ounces. I've got whatever it is in there, and then I hit Calculate Lie. This is where I find out with my recipe, 64 ounces, how much lye I need. If I wanted to have it absolutely one-to-one, -one, completely used up with no free oil, I would want to use 9.3 ounces of lye for this batch of soap. As you come down, you subtract some of the lye to super fat. That means that there's more fat than lye in the bar. 5 to 7 percent is what is recommended. So you can start at 9.05. I use 8.08, which is right in between the 7 and 8 percent to get the nice moisturizing bar that I do. And if you wanted to do a very stringent bar for your laundry and that's what you were making your soap for this time, yeah, I would probably do a 1 or 2 percent. But other than that, I stay right here in the 7 to 8 percent range and I get a wonderful bar of soap. 
You can find out online different saponification values of your different soaps, and you can do your additions and divisions and all of that if you would like. But I have found, because I'm not a real strong person in math, that this works easier for me, and I can go back and make new recipes as often as I like. I can resize my batch. This is my current batch. New recipes, and all I have to do is come up here into my tools to print it out. If you don't like this recipe, you just go New Recipe, and it takes you right back to the beginning again. And you can just select any kind of oils you want. Lanolin lard, mink oil, olive oil, orange butter, pistachio nut oil, carrot oil, apricot kernel oil, aloe extract, uh, acacia butter, everything that you want is right here. So enjoy making up your own recipes and enjoy making soap.